So the thing with faith and destiny is that you have to have a faith in yourself so you can choose your own destiny. That's why I say the power you seek is the power within. Because every quantum steps that you're taking, every small, tiny steps that you're taking, you are either going towards your dream or going away from it. You get to choose. Shanaz, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm excited to speak with you. For those of you who are tuning in, Shanaz is a rocket scientist. She is also an author of The Quantum Being. She's also a spiritual alchemist and quantum coach. And if I could quote you really quickly, you say that today I am living the adventurous life of a Star Trek cadet where science fiction intersects with reality. My current position as an aerospace engineer for NASA enables me to converge science with innovative technology that goes beyond Earth. And when I read that, I was like, it seems like you're living a dream life. But I, I did, you know, listen to your book and I loved it. Your story is so powerful and it just screams resilience and taking charge of your own life, right? So I want to start there. I want to start with your journey and how did your journey shape your understanding of um, fate and personal destiny? Okay. So first of all, uh, Jimmy, thank you for this opportunity to be on the podcast, which is all about shifting dimension. And to me, we are not just shifting dimension, we're accessing dimension as we're shifting them, right? Because it's kind of intertwined. So yeah, and it's interesting that you're asking about how my journey led me to discern between faith and destiny. And that is exactly the reason I think that I created or co-created the different reality for me by choosing where my destiny should be versus letting other people choose that for me. And that has been pretty much my signature throughout my life. That is the main reason you're talking to me right now, right? Because I was given, I was like uh, given a reality, which is what I was being groomed for. It's almost like, you know, you're a ballet dancer and you're being groomed to be a ballet dancer and you, your, your parents, your entire culture, everybody's saying you are going to be a ballet dancer and then you become one, right? For me, that was the thing that my vision that was given to me was that you're going to be someone in the kitchen, you know, serving food, it depends on the richness level, maybe telling somebody else to make the food, but you will be doing home making things and you're going to be making sure that you run the family from home. It was a vision that was confined to me, partly because I had no idea what I'm capable of, but I didn't want to dial only one channel of being a homemaker, right? And so from that point on, that, that destiny that was given to me, which was preconceived based on all the people around me, all the women, right, in my community, in my culture, in my religion, they were all following a certain pattern and rhythm, and they were all parking themselves in the kitchen. Even if you become a doctor, even if you become an engineer, you park yourself in the kitchen, ultimately. Because you get married and your husband decides your faith and that becomes your destiny. So the thing with faith and destiny is that you have to have a faith in yourself so you can choose your own destiny. That's pretty much what I'm saying in this whole storyline for anyone and everyone who is listening is that you can choose your destiny if you have faith in yourself. But because you have always given faith to other people, which means you have given your power to other people and they can come in any shape and form. You are the one who gives them the credential, puts them on a pedestal, you know, you create this big giant boundary between them and you, and you say to yourself that I'm so fearful that I'm going to follow along. And just so <laughs> that the listeners can really understand, you know, the culture you're talking about, I believe you were born and raised in Pakistan, correct? Yes. Yes. And, you know, you had, like you said, you really had to create your own destiny for yourself, right? Because your culture and your religion, I believe you were Muslim, kind of set you on a path where you were supposed to be a homemaker, right? But you were super studious, right? You wanted to be a doctor, but I think your dad said no. So you went for engineering instead and basically found yourself in the U.S., right, through an arranged marriage. And then that kind of set you on the trajectory that you're on right now. So could you kind of give some details on on your story and some of the, the challenges that you had to face in order to be the woman that you are today? Yeah, so the interesting thing is that I had my own personal interest. For example, 
I was very interested in Star Trek, even growing up in Karachi, where I could not speak English, right? So I knew that I would love to be in a Star Trek, like as, a, as my reality, I already knew that. But I knew that that was pretty far-fetched because first of all, I felt it's almost like you're going from one planet to another, right? Like if you are on Earth and you want to be on Mars, it's a different storyline. And that's what I felt when I watched the Star Trek. Not only that, if Martian speaks a different language than earthly beings, that's another big giant leap, right? So to me, I kind of knew that this looks like a far-fetched dream, but it was embedded in me. And part of me knew that if I can learn to speak English, at least I can understand Star Trek better, right? So there was that connection point for me. So the thing is that when you have an innate desire and a dream and something that may look far-fetched, but if you have, if you can pick up any aspect of it, right? Because you don't have to necessarily create exactly what you want. You can just say, let me do what I can do today. So what I started doing, I started focusing on my English and I always had an interest in understanding consciousness, understanding the word. So I was very studious. So, so to me, my school became my escape, my, my, my learning in the school and, and the fact that I was told not to go to school and the fact that I actually wanted to be a rebellious in my own way, wherever I can get away with, of course. So that to me was one way I felt that I was embracing freedom. So that was my thing that I did and ultimately it kept growing and growing and growing. And I had this extreme desire to speak English. So to me, I ultimately attracted a story where I wanted to experience the marriage, arrange marriage, go all the way from, you know, Karachi to LA, be with the man who basically lives in a country where I have to learn to speak English. So you see how it happened in a very different way, but it happened. So ultimately, I think that my message to everyone listening is that whatever you really desire, if you do anything towards it, that quantum step, ultimately you're going to get more than what you want ultimately, right? But it's going to go through a lot of shifting dimensions, right? Before it can get there. So you just have to accept the fact that that's just the nature of the quantum dance because we all, we have to remind ourselves that do we believe in ourselves? And in the process, we create a lot of obstacles, lots of hurdles, Lots of no's. For me, it was a lot of no's. So the fact that I kept believing in me, even though there were times I did not, and I went through my, you know, suffering, my sadness, my crying, my questioning, my asking everyone, including non-physical being, that journey was ongoing. But it made me, um, basically, it sharp sharpened me, right? Just by virtue of going through it, because there is no other way. It's like, if you want to go to the other dimension, you have to go through it. Yes, I 100% agree with you. And listening to your story, there are so many parts I could, you know, resonate with. I'm the eldest daughter in my family as well. And, you know, there's this pressure put on you where you have to set an example for your siblings and you just have to act a certain way because, you know, you're supposed to be respectable. You're supposed to honor your parents and all that stuff. And a, a lot of people can identify with that, but that was something that I resonated with in your story, right? Where you, you had the foresight or the insight to make decisions that were aligned for you, but you were still trying to balance the expectations of other people, right? The expectations of your husband in your first marriage and his um, and his mother, your mother-in-law, right? And there was a point in your story when I was listening to your book where you were kind of at a crossroads, right? You were trying to figure out, should you divorce your husband? Should you not divorce your husband? You could not, you could no longer sustain the relationship or the life that you were living. You enjoyed your job, but you were, you know, deeply unhappy. And you talk about the ICPR method, right? That helped you change course, right? Because we talk about being quantum beings and we're going to dive deeper into what it means to be a quantum being and what it means to take inspired action. But there was this, you know, practical um, exercise that you put forth in the book that you use to help you kind of figure out the next step for you to take. And it's like I said, it's called the ICPR method, which st stands for inquisitive, perseverance, resilient, and courageous. So can you talk about that period of your life? and how mm -hmm. you use that method to go in, on a different path? Yes, so that that is what I say, that we all have strength and we all have attributes. So if you can um, basically list all your attributes and you can give it an acronym, that's pretty much what I did, right? And I am an engineer, so I'm like master when it comes to acronyms. 
And apparently my acronym became ICPR, which kind of aligns with giving CPR to yourself. Because, you know, we are, we are trained, like even when you take training for CPR, it's all about everybody else. But the fact of the matter is that we are the one who has to make sure that we are alive inside and outside, right? And so ICPR ended up becoming my acronym. But the fact is that I have always been inquisitive. That to me, the curiosity within me, the childlike curiosity, is the main reason I have traversed space and time, shifting dimensions all, all across the board, right? In all different timelines. So that is one of my features that I was born with. And I'm very grateful for that. And I believe every single one of us have that feature in, in us. Sometimes because we follow other people and we get so lost in that, like Wizard of the Oz, that we don't realize that you have that built-in feature in you if you want to activate it. But it does come with self-responsibility because when you're curious or when you're inquisitive, now it's all on you. You see, in all other possibilities, you can say, well, my mom said that. Oh, my brother said that. Oh, my husband said that, right? You can blame other people. It just kind of takes the burden away from you. So you can always live with that reality. And some people love to live in a reality where they can blame everybody else for everything that happens to them, right? Because it's kind of a cop-out. I mean, I'm, I know it's, it sounds kind of brutal, but that to me is what I say in my book, The Quantum Being, that no matter what happens to you, even if you're a victim, because we all have been a victim at one point, responsibility is on you to actually even ask the question that what can I do, right? What can I do to exit this? Because even if you ask a question and don't do anything, the fact that you ask the question based on quantum physics, you have opened the new door just by even asking a question. And then what you can do is like, like any, and everyone has a strength and weakness. We all have it, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your stages, in your ages, in your life, in your health, it doesn't matter. We all have strength and weakness. So you make a list of those. And in my case, I knew my strength was CPR, which is the courage, being courageous, being perseverant and being resilient. So courage, it was interesting, right? Because I do quote in my book, the definition of courage is not really that you just know what you're doing and you just like really confident in what you're doing. No, it's opposite of that. The definition of courage is all about doing something that you're extremely comfortable, uncomfortable and still do it, right? And that means going into unknown. And that to me is what is required when you want to change something in your life. You're going to have to tap into that dark matter, that unknown. And then if you have a perseverance, which means that you're not going to give up no matter what, right? And then you're resilient enough to keep on layering all the learnings. That's how you basically can traverse space and time to park yourself into a whole different reality. I think you said that so well because there was a quote in your book that you said, um, my people pleasing prevented me from taking self-responsibility over my own happiness. And I think, again, I could really resonate with that, <laughs> right? Because we could move through the world saying, well, it's because of this and and this person this, did this to me and the, um, that situation put me in this predicament. Like we can continue to point the finger, but we can't really move the needle and sort of take a quantum leap or jump into a different reality that's more aligned with us until we start asking those questions and taking having the courage to move forward, right? Because sometimes you might not know what you're stepping into. You might face a lot of pushback from the people in your life by taking action that goes against what they expect you to take. But, you know, you have to step into that courage. You have to be inquisitive. And like you said, you have to be, um, you have to persevere through it. So I, again, I really, you know, resonated with that. And again, something that I love throughout your whole story, one of the biggest themes was just the fact that you were such a big dreamer, right? Like, again, you were attracting all these experiences into your life because you had a fascination for Star Trek and now you work for NASA, right? As a, <laughs> as a rocket scientist or like aerospace engineer. And that is just mind blowing, right? But throughout your journey, you've continued to mix in like ancient wisdom and that like spiritual side of things. So in, in reading your book and even talking to you now, it's clear that you merge science and spirituality. Like you don't see them as mutually exclusive things, which a lot of people do in this world. So I just think that the knowledge that you're imparting is just, just very relevant for our times, right? So I want to go back to the dreaming and why it's important for us to be dreamers and kind of move through this world 
not like it's a fantasy, but almost kind of having that idea that anything is possible. Why, why do you think that's important? It's 100% important because first of all, you have everything you just need to attract what you want. You do. Every one of us do. Because if you are, if you are, if you have this vision as a dreamer, right, or visionary, if you have a vision means that there's a reason that you resonate with that frequency, even if it comes in a form of image. Ultimately, you can become one with that image if you really, really want to. But there are multiple aspects of it, right? One of the biggest aspects of it is that do you believe in yourself to get there? That is the very important one, right? Because if you look at the image and you create a big giant barrier between you and the image, and then you say, this is impossible, this is just a dream, it is not gonna ever become a reality, guess what? You are right. <laughs> because you have the power to say yes or power to say no. So you're right. If you believe in yourself, you are right if you don't believe in yourself. So what I actually help people understand by going into different aspect of my personal journey and what I've learned through mystery school teaching is that every one of us are capable of attracting the dream that they would want in their life, providing that they're not compromising their integrity, providing that they're not compromising someone else's will, right? So because at the end of the day, in the quantum field, everything has interaction going on with the cause and effect, Newton's third law of motion. And that is what perpetuates all our experiences. And that's what perpetuates what you end up interacting with in the form of people, in the form of places, in the form of pattern, in the form of process. And that's what I teach in my reality shopping course, all the difference, distinction, and how you can choose to merge with the dream. Speaking of reality shopping, right, there's something that you say that we live in a holographic you know, universe, right? And my understanding of that is kind of goes to the whole like quantum realm, right? And like what you said, like in terms of like what we think is mirrored back to us because we kind of like live in that holographic universe. And I, I want you to explain what that actually means and if that relates to living in a simulation like a lot of people talk about. But, you know, I agree with you, I think in the in the quantum realm, right? there's this idea of infinite possibilities, right? And it's about aligning yourself on the path that is for your highest and most authentic good, right? I think another thing you said um, that I, I think is important to quote here, you said, when we live in alignment, everything is like magic, right? And I think that's part of like being a dreamer and being a quantum being as we continue to talk about more in depth about what a quantum being means further in the interview, but I want to start off with, you know, the notion of living in a holographic universe. Can you add some more context to that? And what does that really mean? And is that similar to living in a simulation? Is that similar similar to simulation um, theory? Right. So basically living in a holographic um, universe pretty much means that how everything ends up getting, turning from matter into form. Just the way everything turns in from that pattern that it follows is a holographic pattern. It's actually a fractal pattern of holograph. So basically it has all the essence of fractals because fractal carries the holographic principle, which actually means that every aspect of that reality contains the full information by itself, standalone. That's just the way everything perpetuates in the universe. So that's that. And then the second principle of fractal reality is bifurcation, which means that everything basically, you know, like a crossroad, I was on a crossroad and I was continuously deciding what to do and where to go. I was basically hopping timeline. So when you understand that we do live in a holographic fractal universe, then it helps you traverse space and time so you can shop for reality with more ease, right? Because these are the principle that makes it easier. And if there is somebody who has created a program where everything that we're interacting with is actually a program and we're all wearing a headset somewhere in some ship, maybe in Mars, and we actually think that we're living here on Earth and doing all these things, but in reality, you are just like Matrix, right? Where you are on a ship somewhere and your actual body is not even here. That is a possibility, yes. So that aligns with the concept of living in a simulation reality. 
So when you say quantum shopping or like your shopping timelines, right? You, like you said, you were at a crossroads and you're trying to figure out, should I not, should I, should I do it? Should I not do it? You said that you were probably hopping timelines. What exactly do you mean by that? If someone was listening to you, like, were you literally hopping a timeline, seeing what your life would look like? Like, you know, in the movies where you hop a timeline, you see what your life would look like if you made one decision. And then you hop in, you go into another timeline and you see what your life would look like if you made oh, a different decision. So is, is that what was happening to you? Yeah, because you can extrapolate because you have capacity to do that. And, mm. and and if you're smart enough, you become better at it. Because I mean, for the most part, when you know that you are in a life where things are not working out, right? Which was the reason. Because if things are working out and everybody's happy and you're having a blast, you are not going to ask a question that, oh, why my life sucks, right? So that's obvious that you're going to only ask the question when you feel like something is not right. Something is not in alignment. So that's when you ask a question, you're like, I don't know why, but I don't feel good. As soon as you ask that question, now the question is, okay, so how can I make it better, right? So now, of course, you're going to have people that you live with, right? Because the people that you live with, you're interacting with them every day. And if you are happy with them, that's amazing. If you're not happy with them, then why? So then for the most part, in my case, I did my best to solve my problem with the people I was living in for two years. So I did not divorce overnight. I worked on saving the marriage for two years because my goal, I, I'm an engineer, I solve problems. My goal was to not, you know, because there's all this life that's going to get affected, right? So I wanted to make sure everybody stays happy. It all works itself out, you know, like, so ideally I didn't want to leave the marriages. Plus I had no idea what my life is going to be. I've never lived alone, let alone living alone in a foreign country where I have no family, no friends, you know, it was not an easy decision. So for me, I would have preferred that I could have made it work. So what I did was I put my best effort in making it work, right? So, so the idea is not to just willingly hop timeline or shop for reality. The idea is that you give your best to what you want to save because you know there are people involved, there's love involved, there's relationship involved. There are side effects when you change things like divorce. It's a very big side effects to everybody involved. So I did my best to save it but when I realized that no matter what I do, I can't, I just can't get there. No matter what I do, because it's not all in my control, because there are other people involved. And when there are other people involved, then they're going to have their own goals, right? They're going to have their own vision they want to merge with. And if it doesn't match with yours, you're going to continuously be like um, banging heads, right? And when you get to that point, so in my case, that was the reason I felt that I've already done all of this. The only thing I haven't done is what if, if I just completely take a route that I have no idea what it's gonna be, but it's going to be different than what it is. That's all I knew, right? So now you are taking, you, that requires a lot of courage because it can be worse, right? It can be worse. Yeah. But, but you have to have a courage to say, you know what? That I don't care whether it's gonna be worse or not. I have to do this for my own sake because I don't want to be 80 years old on the you know bed in front of my family and sharing my story where I'm like, yeah, you know, I was in a very sad marriage and I spent two years trying to save it. And then I come to the conclusion that, you know what? I'm not happy, but I'm just going to stay here forever. Can you believe how bad that story sounds? So just to make sure <laughs> I fully understand. No, that was good. It you have to kind of change your story. So just to make sure I fully understand for the listeners yeah. who are listening, when it comes to quantum shopping, like you said, you know, you kind of were able to kind of predict potentially what your life would look like if you stayed in an unhappy marriage versus you not staying. It's not like you had all of the details and you could literally see your future per se, but you knew that the path that you were on would lead to more unhappiness and the path exactly. that you if you decide to go a different way, that could potentially lead to happiness, right? So in a way, there's there's a probably a version of you, right? If we want to kind of tie in the time hopping piece to it, there's probably a version of you who stayed with your ex-husband, your, you know, and exactly. you're you're doing that life. And then there's this version of you who decided to go on a different path. So now you've left that timeline where you were still with your husband and now you're living this reality where you're you're not in an unhappy marriage right and the reason why I'm trying to like make it as plain as possible is because you know 
I think people are so literal, right? Because they're like, how do you know? I'm like, isn't that just your current life and you just made a different decision? But if you believe that there are infinite possibilities and you believe in the idea of the multiverse, right? And if you watch shows like every uh, a movie called Everything Everywhere All at Once or Loki, yeah. which is from um, the Marvel universe that those movies right they really go in depth and talk about all of these different timelines so that's what you're trying to to get at like you you tapped into a different timeline where you were in, in an unhappy marriage 100 percent, and that is the thing you, you mentioned yourself right that the quantum world enables you to tap into infinite possibilities so why would you waste all your energy dialing just one channel where you have nothing but dissatisfaction nothing but disapproval nothing but disappointment. I mean, so if you think about it, the fact that you think that you're limited and the fact that you don't believe that you're a quantum being who can open other doors to other timeline, that's where I say shame on you because you are more than that. You can do it if you want to. And you should want to because you are capable of. Right. It it boils down to the will. Another quote that I loved from you. I You had so many amazing quotes in your book. You said a human being can move a mountain if they have will. And it just boils down to that intention, that belief that you can make that change. And speaking of, you know, quantum shopping, we've been using the word quantum a lot, right? So I want to ask, what does it actually mean to be a quantum being? But before we even talk about that, what is the quantum realm, right? Because people talk about it all the time, right? We we see it in movies. We 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 hear it in like discourse when it comes. You have different scientists that are talking about um, particles and you know all of these things. But how would you describe quantum, the quantum realm, to a lay person? And then how does that tie into being a quantum being? Okay. So first of all, everybody studies classical physics in school, right? So physics was actually a way for us to understand how energy turns into matter, right? Physically, it's, it's physical physics. Quantum physics basically covers the physics of a very, very small. So quantum actually means very, very small in different languages, right? So that's pretty much the reason quantum came into existence. So quantum as a word means discrete, small. And quantum being, basically, the whole reason is that we are continuously, uh, based on the study that was done by the two scientists from Oxford who were anesthesiologists, and they wanted to understand the consciousness, they actually studied consciousness, and they came to this conclusion after 30 years of working on it, um, Dr. Uh, Hameroff, right, and Dr. Uh, Sir Roger Penrose. Those two guys, basically, came with this conclusion that based on the way our human brain works and interacts with the mind, it basically taps into the reality every nanosecond, which means that truly, uh, you know, just like we watch a television and everything looks like a one screen, the way we interact with the world, everything is pixelated in reality as well, just like a television screen. And we are processing information where we can actually change our image every 90 seconds. So the very fact that you can change your image every 90 seconds based on that research and science that I explain in my chapter 11, that to me is a one reason that you should know that how quickly, because you are continuously moving because you are not static, you're a dynamic, you're a being. So quantum being basically taps into the fact that you have a power. Every nanosecond you get to choose which timeline to shop to. And that is pretty much hidden in the name quantum being is that that's why I say the power you seek is the power within. Because every quantum steps that you're taking, every small, tiny steps that you're taking, you are either going towards your dream or going away from it. You get to choose. Wow, that's so fascinating. Every step you're taking, you're either going towards your dream or going away from it. I've also heard people talk about the quantum realm like for, for those of you, if you need a visual, right? Like, I don't know if you've watched Ant-Man, if you watch Ant-Man, it's a Marvel movie where the superhero is able to basically shrink himself to a microscopic level. And he gets so small that he enters this world, this quantum realm that or this quantum universe that he had no idea about. Time works differently over there. Time doesn't even I don't know if time even exists over there. Right. It's like a completely different world. Now, I don't know if that's a real depiction of the quantum realm. We'll never know. But I think that's a, a good example for those of you who need visuals or if you're listening to this and, and, and you 
want to go look up something as to like what we're talking about. But just, you know, to your point about like every step we, we take, we're making that decision to work towards our, our personal destiny. But that's the thing that a lot of people struggle with, right? They don't know. I think a lot of people have lost the ability to connect with the authentic self, right? Because we live in a society that tells us what we should want, what we should desire, what we should dream of, what is possible, what's not possible. But here you're literally saying that anything is possible, that we can make anything come true. We can manifest anything, right? So, and and obviously that's part of why you wrote your book. And, and that's what I want to, you know, really talk about. Like, why was it important for you to write this book, Quantum Being, a self-sustaining and magnificent human craft. Why was it important for you to to put these ideas into paper? So initially the book happened because from the day one when I came to States and I was going through so many challenges, you know, cultural, language, marital, and um, having to grow, right, uh, from that transition from being a girl to a woman, right, from being a princess to be a queen. That journey, whenever I shared with people, they were like in awe, like everywhere I would go. And if I, because people would ask me, where are you from? Right. And then I would say, and then say, what brought you here? And then I would say, and then they were like, oh my God, I've never met anyone like you. That was the, that was what I got all the time. And then, and then people would be like, my God, your story is inspiring. You know, I, I wish you can write a book. So I was getting that for years and years and years, and it was compounding. Right. So I was aware back in my mind that I need to write a book, but I was not sure that how it's going to come about because part of me knew that my story is powerful but part of me also knew that I'm not someone famous like Angelina Jolie that people are going to say oh Shana Sony let me pick her book so I was thinking that how can I make this book useful for anyone and everyone so whether they are inspired by my story or not they are going to get the nugget that I want to share with them based on what I learned from my transition from my transformation so what I did was I actually did something that I don't think I've seen anyone else do. At least I did it what I thought was right. So I kind of made this book as a multi-layer book itself, right? Because I shared my story from one to four, but from five to 12, I shared my wisdom that I acquired through my personal life and through my actively seeking to understand and expand consciousness. So that became an interesting thing. And the quantum being title happened also as I was writing my book in that six month, it all happened on its own. The draft, I didn't have any idea what the title is going to be, but when I was really done and I just felt that that, that title just were, encapsulates what I'm projecting. So yeah, it was a very dynamic and very much interactive process with the universe. Like it wasn't something that I thought about it it was more like I was led yes it definitely seems like something that was birthed out of your experience and and it's good that you're sharing it with the world because again I just think your your personal story and just the job that you have and also the interest that you have when it comes to spirituality and merging all of that stuff together is just really important at this time in this you know in this world right now and you know back to what I was talking about in terms of people not being able to tap into the the authentic version of themselves, right? In order to manifest, because we're manifesting all the time, right? The goal is to manifest stuff that's in alignment with us. So how, what advice would you give to someone who is, has people pleased so much or have, has gone on a path so far away from where they should be on, right? They're not in alignment what advice would you give to them to kind of finding their way back to themselves so that they can start being in line with their true nature and dreams? Yeah, because I've been a people pleaser most of my life too. And I still am to some extent because it's not going to just disappear. And I think it's good because it keeps me anchored in this physical world, right? Because we all have to, we're all here for a reason, right? So we might as well make the most of it. So the whole thing is that everybody that is in your life right now if you really do, and this is another class I'm planning on teaching, which is going to help people understand. Uh, I'm going to probably title it Relationship Dynamics because the whole idea is, and my chapter six, remember that chapter six is what I'm going to help people truly embody it. Because at the end of the day, when you really understand that how every single person in your life is a mirror to you, right? And because that is the fundamental reason they're in your life, 
you can update that storyline. And that is what I, what, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can unwind um, way further. But the, but the bottom line message is that if you are ready to kind of follow your own destiny, right? And have faith in yourself, right? Because that's the key. Then you will no longer be looking for validation outside of yourself. Because people pleasing pretty much means that we don't trust ourselves. So we want everybody else to like us or love us. And because we are so consumed by our ego and by our desire to be liked, that in the process, we lose ourselves. You're absolutely right. And I think you also mentioned in your book as well that we're really, a lot of our purpose is really to go on a journey to get to know ourselves, right? Like, this this journey is about really fully self actualize self actualizing, and the more you self actualize, it's not just a personal selfish thing. I don't believe. I think it's for the greater collective, the greater consciousness, right? Because we all have different gifts, right? Like your story, I know it touched me. I it made me feel seen in certain aspects of my life, so I was able to connect with you in that way, and just hearing all the things you were able to overcome to like have this magical life really makes me feel like, okay, there's hope. Like it strengthens my faith. Right. So like now you've added again to the collective consciousness. So a lot of, a lot of the journeys that we go on, a lot of the experiences that we have are not just for us, they're for other people. But again, like we need to make sure that we are fully in alignment and really make sure that we are self-actualizing in the best way possible. And that can be hard, right? Because a lot of times that self-actualization will force you to go against the grain, right? But we live in a life, we live at a point now where authenticity is like the highest vibration that we all need to be, you know, aligned to. And I know that that's a word that people use all the time, like be authentic, be authentic. And I'm not saying like be authentic in a space where let's say you're at work and you're mad at your boss and you yell at him. That's not being authentic. That's just <laughs> not, you know, having any social decorum, but being authentic means following the things that light you up in your soul, in your core, and just being unapologetically you, right? Whatever your curiosity is, whatever your gift is, um, whatever interest that you have, I think it's important for you to be aligned with that. And, you know, speaking about alignment, like we talked about before as well, manifestation, and there's a, there's something you talk about in your book that I was really eager to, to talk to you more about, which is the significance of the 369 method in manifestation. I'm really big on numbers, especially like angel numbers and, and patterns and, you know, three, six, and nine, those numbers are talked about often and, and how do they relate to manifestation? So if you look at the the world, like the universe as, as a whole, you and the universe, you and the universe as one entity, and then you look at the tip of the iceberg, let's say you look at the tip of the iceberg and you look at the part of the iceberg that's hidden, the tip of the iceberg represents everything that you end up interacting in physical dimension. Everything that's hidden, kind of dark matter, that is what is non-physical dimension. So when you are basically using the math to represent physical versus non-physical, 369 is a representation of non-physical dimension. And it is explained by vortex math. And Tesla was the one who discovered it. And that's why 369 is called Tesla code. And I um, just naturally embody it in my life because I'm very, I understand it. And I learned about it when I was teaching Kabbalah 10 years ago. So it's a basically a understanding of how unmanifest creates manifest. So that is the journey of light. And I'm actually writing my next book where I explain that in a little different way because I realize that even though, I mean, I am a Kabbalist because I understand Kabbalah, I also understand quantum physics. Both of them explain how light transforms into matter, right? Light is an energy and it transforms from unmanifest to manifest. So the only time you see the light when it becomes dense enough for you to see it. So 369 basically is a representation of all the quantum possibilities that's hidden in the dark matter. 
So is that the unmanifest part, which is like all the possibilities that are hitting in the dark matter and then kind of the manifest comes into play when I guess we focus our attention on one of those possibilities, right? Is that is that oversimplified? Yeah, it's oversimplified. Okay. So basically it's connected with vortex math and it gets pretty deep. Mm -hmm. But that is the thing that I actually realized that I'm going to have to create a course on that because it would be a really good one. Because as I said, I love explaining these things, but it's kind of like, you know, like there are layers and layers and layers of information, right? And as you can see, even in my book, I've done my best to pretty much give as much as possible. But I realized that everybody is going to pick up what they are meant to pick up right now. But the good thing about the book is it kind of becomes the book that you can go to because you can go to the book and you can open a page and you'll be like, oh, wow, yeah, that's what I needed today, right? Because it's going to speak to you. And that is, was my intention with the book. Um, and I don't know how deep I go into the 369, but it is, yeah, it, it is a representation of everything that's unmanifested, which is why people are using, and it's funny because I even saw the article on 369, and it was written with two page and had like a huge review, but they didn't explain what I just explained to you. Mm. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Like I have to do deeper research into the unmanifest becoming the manifest because my brain is like, I guess the unmanifest part of that is the potential, right? And then the manifest is the potential being actualized, right? Exactly. Like, okay, exactly. that's the best way to put it. And, yes. you know, I also have to ask, because I know that you grew up Muslim. So with the work that you've been doing, especially as it pertains to consciousness and all of that stuff, do you still identify as a Muslim or how has your spiritual or religious identification shifted if it has shifted? Yeah. So Muslim actually means messenger. I think uh, it's a, uh... Some, it's a very, like when you see the meaning of Muslim, it's actually very, everybody's Muslim according to the meaning in Arabic. It's funny, right? Islam actually means peace, right? So, I mean, when you really start looking at the meanings and people are like fighting over so many things and when you really boil down to simple math, it's like, you know, we, we all want the same damn thing, right? It's funny how that is. Now, I believe that being raised as a Muslim, I'm actually very happy that I was because I was given a very, very strong foundation of being a good person, right? Like I like it was all about honesty. It was all about integrity. It was all about what goes around comes around, right? So there are basic principle, like you know, like 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 ten commandments. I'm using it as a general word that Muslim follows. They're very very beautiful, right? And I think that all religion have good stuff that they actually want you to do, right? So that to me is was my foundation because I went to the madrasa. I was being proper, very pious Muslim girl until I was 30 years old, which is when I decided to embark and figure out who I am by not following the protocol I was told, but creating a new protocol to become spiritual. And in that journey, I stumbled onto Kabbalah and all that. So the point is the very fact that I had the strong foundation, it helped me because I did, I do have an operating principle that I use and they are very much foundationally what I got in my childhood because that's what makes me who I am. They're my core principle and, and no one can take it. And I believe and I believe in uh, Islam is a very beautiful religion for that reason. I personally call myself as more like a spirit in human body, right? Who came to experience it all. Like most of my friends actually are always Christian and other religions because I live in a foreign country where there are not, um, like I'm in a community right now that Muslims are like one or two out of hundreds. So I don't really have the interaction with them, which means that I was meant to learn it when I did. I embody what I had to, and then I have to move on to, to add another layers, which is what I've been doing, right? So yeah, I don't like to put myself in any one limited religion, because to me, that's a limitation of a, of a conscious being, of a quantum being. So I basically say that I am physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual being, which is why I say I'm the quantum being, which covers it all. Yes, I love it. And, you know, I, I have to ask because it's important. Since you work for NASA, right? Like a lot of people in the spiritual community talk about star seeds and, you know, especially as it pertains to reincarnation and coming from different galaxies and, you know, having different experiences in different universes as different beings and then kind of incarnating into the human body. And now there's this whole like race to space with like Elon Musk and um, I believe Jeff Bezos is 
part of that yes. as well. Um, so just want to get your thoughts on, I, I don't want to assume that you believe in aliens, right? But why do you think it's important to kind of study space and, and study other planets and, you know, evolve towards being interdimensional beings? That's, I guess that's part of like the race to space, right? Because ideally we want to be able to inhabit Mars, for for example, right? So just want to learn more about your work and how how that feeds into your personal beliefs of like star seeds and, and aliens and all that stuff. Yeah, so actually it's funny because when you really look at all the elements that we have in our body, right? They represent that we are the star stuff. So based on that, all human beings are star seed. If you really look at it, just based on chemical composition, right? The elemental composition that we all have within our body as a human species. So that right there answers that first question of yours. Then now the very fact is, yes, of course I do believe. I don't believe, I don't call it alien because alien to me, I was an alien when I came to the United States for a long time before I became a citizen. So I think alien is not very smart choice of word because alien actually means strange. And I don't think there's anything strange about ETs because they have been in our movies, they have been all over in our lives, whether we accept it or not, they are there. So I call them extraterrestrial. And when you really look at the word extraterrestrial, that just means that they are not in the terrestrial boundary where we are, right? So they're extraterrestrial, which means they're from a different planet. The very fact that we do all these extra, you know, like a, there's so much budget gets allocated to space exploration, partly means that we do believe that there is more to the story than just human species. So yeah, there's no question in my mind that there are other species out there and we're interacting with them. There's just no question. Um, I don't know that how you found me, but if you have uh, seen my interview with Alex Ferrari on Next Level Soul, and especially in the second one, we go really deep dive into the UAPs and so forth. So yeah, that is 100% um, part of the reason that we're doing all this is because we do believe that there are other extraterrestrial out there whom we need to interact with, work with. And that's what Star Trek was all about. Star Trek pretty much showed that interaction with other species. And I do believe that in, in real life, we already are interacting with them. And uh, the very fact that it hasn't been very much talked about or exposed is partly because we haven't been ready to interact with that reality. Well, I, I know that recently there was a meeting in Congress basically kind of saying that alien, sorry, extraterrestrials, right, um, <laughs> do exist, right? Like admitting to that. And to your point, I think the government has had an idea of their existence for a very, very long time, but obviously not exposing that to the public because they don't want to create mass mania. But do you think more communication is going to come out regarding um, extraterrestrial contact and, and all that stuff? I personally think that just like we don't want to be a people pleaser, we should not be relying on government for everything. Because that is the one reason we gave so much power to the government, that we are in a situation where we are hoping that government can do certain things for our own livelihood. Can you believe that? That's not very smart at all. So all of us have to take our power back because government is, the only reason government exists is because we wanted the government to help us coexist with each other. But the very fact that if the government is not doing what it meant to do, then we all have to definitely roll up our sleeves, right? And do what needs to be done for our own self and for, for the sake of humanity. So my whole thing is that we should no longer rely on any external influence for anything that we wanna understand about ourselves and about extraterrestrial, we should all just open our mind in a way that we're open to see what life is about. Because when you open your mind up and just break all the judgment and all the labels of conspiracy theorists and all the stuff that blocks your energy flow, just open the portal and then just see for yourself because you know whatever you are meant to interact with, if you're in alignment, right, it's gonna come to you. If you're meant to understand extraterrestrial because that's part of your life story, you are going to understand that. But if it's not, it doesn't really matter because it works itself out. You see, because everybody doesn't dial the exact same channel, right? For example, I love sci-fi. Somebody else may love lifetime television. 
So they're only interested in lifetime television. They may never have to interact with the extraterrestrial because that's not part of their storyline. And to me, we all have to honor whatever our storyline is, whatever our interest is, whatever excites us. So if we stop wasting time trying to persuade other people to watch the channel that we are on, we will all be much more happy. I really love how you put that because I think a lot of people who are into sci-fi, for example, into spirituality, into all of these like metaphysical concepts that a lot of people don't think about on a daily basis are kind of scared to talk about it because people don't, people are afraid like, oh, are people going to think I'm crazy, right? But if we stop worrying about the people who aren't aligned with us and we follow our curiosity, right, and continue to dial into the channel that is resonating with us, then that's all that really matters. So I, I love that you, I love that you said that. Exactly, because, you know, one thing I've noticed, because when I've been in America, I've noticed that every state has their games, right? And every state has their loyalty to the schools based on the games that they want to play. And they all get together for all these games. And then people belong and then they throw parties, right? Everybody. And I'm like, it's very game centered, right? I'm not into the games like that. I am more interested in the puzzle of life, right? So I'm different. But the fact of the matter is that why not us who are interested in consciousness, right, can also have like a movie night where all gets together and then we watch the movie that expands our consciousness and we can have our own community right because it's very interesting how we have a certain things hyped up but the certain thing is labeled those like don't do to go there it's almost like why why would you not encourage people to just follow their interest whether it's ancient mysteries or whether it's a football right because we all should have the freedom to dial the channel that we want to dial without having to feel being judged. Just like people who are completely into football, like they are being put on a pedestal. Why is that? So that to me is very unbalanced way of, you know, like imposing how you should shop for your reality, you see? And that I don't agree with. I 100% agree with everything that you said. And so, you know, what do you think the next phase of humanity is, right? Because I, I obviously you're you're an engineer, you're a scientist. And, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the different levels of civilization, right? So a lot of people have been saying, I believe it were, it seems like humanity shifting towards either level two or level three, where we start becoming more interdimensional in terms of like space travel and, you know, kind of developing um, more high level technology that will give us this, these abilities, right? To travel space and, you know, go potentially colonize other planets, et cetera, right? So what do you think the next phase of humanity is on a conscious level and on a technological level? So what I would like to happen um, is definitely we're going to moon and Mars, right? I work for NASA and that program is already, that is the vision, right? Is that to learn to live on in places that is not designed for human but we can make it work based on the technology that we have, right? That's the idea of colonizing moon and Mars. So that's already happening. And in, 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 even on earth, you know, we're basically moving from a lot of things that human used to do, like, you know, drones are doing it or AI is doing it, right? So we are already moving in that direction. So basically it's happening from both sides, earth and also moving into different planets. My uh, whole uh, vision for humanity is that the more and more humanity needs to understand what their capacity and capability is, which is the reason I wrote the book, The Quantum Being, right? Because my whole thing is, and this is my way of sharing my wisdom to humanity and also helping people understand that when you understand the power that you actually have as a multidimensional species, then the good thing is that you're going to start looking at it from your perspective that what do you want to do to exist with other people, right? So as soon as you take the matter in your hand, and, it, and, it, and that doesn't require you to change your religion or change your belief or change your principle. You just have to take the responsibility of your own part of existence because we all have to, because I can't control you and you can't control me. So the only way we, it's going to be properly aligned is that you control yourself, right? So that is why I think that if everybody will start doing it like self-actualized way of existing, then what's going to happen is that a lot of decisions that we have been making up to this point, because we were not really self-actualized or we were not looking at a bigger perspective or we were not taking the matter in our hand to decide our faith and destiny. When we do that, then we are going to completely look at things differently, first of all. 
And then we're going to realize that, oh, wow, I truly don't think that I align with this. Oh, I align with this. So as we're making the choice to go towards our dream, we are going to converge with more and more people who are going to the same place. I think people also kind of call that like almost creating like a heaven on earth potentially. Yes, right. hundred percent. I say that all the time too. So yeah, that convergence is what's needed. However, it will only come when people will use their intuition. Because if you use somebody else's, if you do people pleasing, if you have a misplaced, you know, um, way to show up in the world, then it's not going to work. It can only work if you do it with accountability, integrity, and intuition. Mm. And authenticity. I think that kind of ties into that as well. That's been the biggest theme and word that keeps coming up in, in, every conversation and it's sad that, that have. we have to it's sad that we have to use that word because if you really think about it i mean the only way to exist is to be authentic yes any other way you're existing you're not aligned that's it completely misaligned and i think that's the reason why a lot of people are unhappy i think that's why a lot of people have like mental health issues because they're in opposition of their desires right and i'm when we talk about desires we're talking about healthy desires that help you grow that feed your soul and also kind of um, reverberate into the greater consciousness and also impact other people in a positive way. Right. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm also curious too. I've heard that Mars is kind of like, um, people have described it as a junkyard planet, whereas like beings, there was a civilization or race of beings that lived there that basically um, destroyed their atmosphere, destroyed their planet. I don't know if you've heard of those stories before, right? Where they they say that they're Martians living underground in Mars because the atmosphere is no longer habitable, but there was a race of beings who, you know, lived in that world. So I don't know if that's true. There's no way for me to figure that out. But I always find it interesting that there's a race towards living in Mars because it feels like we're trying to inhabit a space that probably was already inhabited and is no longer habitable. So I don't know if that's something you, you think about, or I don't know if you come across those discussions at all when it comes to your work. Well, the interesting thing is, so yes, I've heard the same stories that you have heard, but uh, you know, when I combine the Mars as a representation of astrology, right? Because we all have a Martian in us to some extent, right? And depending on what astrology sign you are, you may have more Martian than not. But the point is that all of us have access to the information because of our DNA. And there is a one school of thought is that we are the Martian who ended up coming to earth because it wasn't habitable. And now we are going back, you see? So if you really think about it, all of these stories have some truth to it because these stories exist in the quantum field partly because we played in it in some ways or form that's why we resonate with it that's why we even carry that as information forward right so when you really start understanding all of that and then when you encompass it then you realize that it's very interesting that how we want to understand ourselves from so many different perspectives that we have made it very convoluted right So there is actually a quotation by someone, right, which says that when you uh, go uh, from one place to another and then you come back to a place which is the same place you started with, right, but you're looking at it from a different perspective is what I say about Mars. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Um, Really enjoyed talking to you about what it means to be a quantum being, what it means to be a dreamer what it means to be authentic and just, you know, being a star seed in general, this has been great. But I have to ask you one final question before we wrap up the conversation. And that is, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? And it could be as lighthearted or as deep as you want it to be. Yeah, I mean, I do that on a regular basis. And every single day, I do so many different things. That makes me feel like, wow, that's so interesting. So, so yeah, I have to think about which story to pull from because uh, there are so many stories. So yeah, one of the one of the things that I just recently experienced, uh, I was in Sedona and I went there uh, for a retreat because I've recently finished my quantum hypnosis certificate under Dolores Cannon and uh, it was a networking. So I wanted to go and check it out and I really loved all the people I met. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I went there with a certain mindset and certain goal and 
during my experience, I was shown something that was a little different than what I thought it needed to be, right? I mean, if you go somewhere, especially when you travel, you know, you spend your money, you spend your energy, you spend your time, you take off from work, you truly are vested and you go with a certain my intention in mind because I, I do everything with intention and goal. And it was, I learned a lot of different lessons while I was there for five days, like really major lessons. And then I also learned that whatever I thought I was going there for, it ended up becoming shifted in, in, a, in, a, in a good way. And I have been already seeing that pattern every time when I go, I always learn something and I say travel is to unravel. And it was very interesting that I learned that. And then I realized that that's pretty much what it's all about, is that you are going to create a projection that you think you are going to meet with based on all the actions you're going to take. But when you meet with that projection and when you're interacting with it, Right there, you're going to actually learn something about yourself that you didn't know because you had not done that interaction before. And that is where evolution is. That's where the growth is. And that's where shifting dimension is. And I did that during my recent travel and it was fun. Thank you for sharing that. If you don't mind me asking, what what idea did you have in your head going into it? And what did it shift to? Like, what experience did you have? that you weren't expecting to have, but it was, you know, it kind of shifted you in a way. So the idea I had was that I'm going to find like people that I will interact with on a regular basis, right? Because I, you know, we all to some extent are looking for people that we can have in our, in our tribe. Uh, and that was the reason I went and I did like a lot of people I ran into. But um, one thing that I realized was that, and there were speakers there that I like also, and I actually interacted with the speaker they were all females and I interacted with the speakers and then I shared with them what I do for a living and what I have done for my passion. And they were very much like 100% interested in what I had to say. And then I told them because they had all these different venues and they had all these different things that they were interacting with, with uh, about 400 people there. And I, I knew that if I would have been given a stage and a mic, I would have truly uh, interacted with them at the level that would have really kind of up their game because that's my natural gift. I would love to do that. Like what you and I are doing, I can do that in front of hundreds of people because it's my natural jam. So I actually told them that I would love to be part of it in a way where I can help them, especially help them elaborate the science behind what Dolores Cannon is saying. And um, so that's what ended up happening. And then of course we exchanged numbers and everything. And then today they texted me and they said that they want to get on a Zoom with me. So it opened the new portal for me and new timeline. And I didn't go thinking that I'm going to make connection with the speaker. I, I went there as more like I'm going to make connection period, right? And then I realized that every single thing that I am doing uh, somewhat is choreographed beyond my imagination. That's an amazing story. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to, you know, learn more about you, get your book and just kind of dig deeper into what you do? Yeah, so my website is pretty much my first name, last name, one word. It's spelled right below there, dot com. And um, I have like two courses on my shop that people can take advantage of. Light body activation is something that I encourage everyone to do every day or every time they feel like it. And it's something the more you do, the better you're going to get at. And the reality shopping is something that helps when your light body is activated, because when you are aligned, then you're looking at things from a different vantage point, and it helps you choose a better reality for yourself. So basically, those are the two courses that I have along with my book and the audio file. And I um, am very grateful for everyone that have come in my light so far and how they have incredible stories to share that it has impacted them positively. So for me, I'm feeling very good that I am here where I need to be. And, um, and uh, one thing I would leave uh, everyone with is that based on quantum physics, when you change one thing, you change everything. So I would encourage everyone to just take one thing from this exchange that Jumi and me had and see what can they put on their calendar, on their phone, anywhere as an action. So I would like for them not to just listen to this. I would like them to embody it by taking an action that comes naturally in their mind that, you know, I would love to do this because of this conversation. It has inspired me to do it. They need to put it on their phone, on their calendar, so they don't leave without taking that action. And once they take the action, they're going to open and shift dimensions. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It was a pleasure having you. Yes, thank you. Pleasure is mine.